So guys, before moving to the heart, uh, let's first talk about the pericardium and then pericardial sinuses. Again, something which holds a, a, a good clinical importance. Uh, when we talk about pericardium, pericardium, the covering of the heart, there are two types of pericardium we have. We got a fibrous pericardium. fibrous pericardium and then we got a serous pericardium the fibrous and the serous pericardium fibrous pericardium is a fibrous layer it's a single layer uh, which is like a bag in which the heart is kept and the uh, what do you say the the base and the apex of fibrous pericardium is not corresponding to the heart like heart is having its posterior uh, its base on the posterior side and apex toward the left side Nothing like that in fibrous pericardium. Fibrous pericardium is having its own base below and the apex is above. So it, it's like a pouch in which the heart is kept. Whereas the serious pericardium which is more adherent to the heart is again having two layers. And those two layers is the parietal layer and visceral layer. So we've got a parietal layer of serous pericardium. And obviously the one which is absolutely adherent to the heart is a visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Let me try to explain this uh, diagrammatically. What is the difference between the two? Now, let's say if this here is the heart. Uh, and these are the great vessels. Let's say I'm looking at the superior vena cava here. And this is diaphragm. The fibrous pericardium, when I say this, the fibrous pericardium is having its base above it's having its apex above, sorry and its base is merging with the central tendon of the diaphragm look at that So that is the fibrous pericardium. As you can see, let me write that also. It is merged with the great vessels. It is merged with the tunica adventitia of great vessels, obviously. Tunica adventitia of great vessels. And also continues with and also continues with pre-tracheal fascia. And it also continues with the pre-tracheal fascia. We discussed this in the in the head and neck also that in, in the deep cervical fascia, pre-tracheal fascia extends till the sternal angle. And at that point, it is merging with the fibrous pericardium. So that is the apex. This is the apex part we're talking about. Apex of the fibrous pericardium. Whereas the base of fibrous pericardium, that here is the base. The base of fibrous pericardium, it is merged with the central tendon of the diaphragm. It is merged with the central tendon of the diaphragm. That is what fibrous pericardium, single layer. Now when it comes to the serous pericardium, we said we got two layers of serous pericardium. One is the parietal layer which is adherent to the fibrous pericardium like this. And then we have a visceral layer which is adherent to the heart. Covering the heart and its coronary vessels closely. This is a visceral layer. And of course the space in between will be the pericardial sinus. A thin film of fluid present inside which acts as a lubricant there. So that is a parietal layer. The one, this one here is the visceral layer. What is to be noted guys, this uh, fibrous pericardium, the one which I have marked as FP and parietal layer of serous pericardium, they both are adherent to each other. So they are more really close related to the body wall. Visceral obviously the word is, word is visceral here, so it is more adherent to the heart. And again, once again, the same way you have to think about their nerve supply. The fibrous pericardium and parietal layer of visceral pericardium. Let me write in short here. 
that fibrous pericardium FP, fibrous pericardium plus parietal layer. I'm writing PL, fibrous pericardium and parietal layer of serous pericardium. They both are supplied by the phrenic nerve. The nerve of body wall, phrenic nerve. And obviously, they are pain sensitive. Whereas, the visceral layer which is adherent to the heart is supplied by the autonomic nerves. And it is pain insensitive. The same kind of thing I told you in the in the plurals that when you think of an outer layer, you think of the body wall, think about the nerves and the blood supply to the body wall and the same will supply the parietal layer. Fibrous pericardium and parietal layer both are fused and they are outside so they are having the nerve supply of the body wall which is phrenic nerve, a somatic nerve and that is pain sensitive. So the pain of pericarditis is solely felt in the fibrous and the parietal layer of the uh, pericardium and not in the visceral layer. Visceral layer is supplied with the autonomic nerve, it is pain insensitive. So this is just about the three layers that uh, fibrous, parietal layer and visceral layer of the pericardium. Okay, now think of a heart tube guys. If, if you think of a heart tube, we discussed that in the embryology part. Now the heart tube, we have an upper end of the heart tube which is called as the arterial end and the lower end is a venous end here. And just presume in this way that there is a heart tube which is covered with the parietal layer, visceral layer and fibrous pericardium, everything. So from this heart tube, if I remove the fibrous pericardium, what along with the fibrous pericardium will be gone is the parietal pericardium is also gone. So we still have the visceral pericardium covering this heart tube here. Just, just you have to presume it this way. And imagine now the folding of the heart tube takes place. Now we know the folding of the heart tube takes place in such a way that arterial end and the venous end they come close to each other. So the folding would take place in the heart, 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 uh, arterial end and the venous end come close to each other which is quite obvious because if you look at the upper border of the heart we have ascending aorta coming out from there and we also have the superior vena cava at the same upper end only which is an indication that arterial and the venous end they came close in the folding of the heart tube. The arterial and the venous end came close to each other but they are not merged with each other. So they are still separated from each other by a space or a sinus and that is called as a pericardial sinus. To understand a pericardial sinus, let me show you a picture in which you will see a, uh, a, a, the, the, the pericardium is present here, but the heart is being removed from there. And then you can see those spaces present in it. So before we draw it, I want all of you to look at this image here. Now this is a picture from which the heart obviously has been removed. There is no heart there and you can only see the, the pericardium there. Well, if you look carefully, the one this outer one guys, this outer line here, it corresponds to the parietal pericardium. And the one which is adherent to the blood vessels and everything, these are the visceral pericardium. This clearly is the ascending iota and this is the pulmonary trunk. We know that ascending iota and pulmonary trunk, they both are derived from the arterial end of the heart tube. That is, they are both coming from the truncus arteriosus. And that's why you will see that there is a single layer of visceral pericardium covering both the blood vessels. Developmentally, they are coming from the same component only. Let me enlarge it. Can you, can you see it? Look at the single layer of visceral pericardium which is covering both the blood vessels here. That's the one. Whereas when you look at the other blood vessel, the veins, like superior vena cava, this one here is an inferior vena cava and all these are four pulmonary veins. Doesn't matter they are carrying oxygenated or deoxygenated blood, but they are all veins. Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava and the four pulmonary veins. Once again, look carefully. There's a single continuous layer of visceral pericardium covering all of them. Look at this one layer which is going around this, continuing on this side, covering these pulmonary veins, then stretching to the other side, covering superior vena cava and then back to the pulmonary veins and to the inferior vena cava. That means this tube here is an arterial tube and this everything here is a venous tube here. So between the arterial tube and the venous tube, which was at the two uh, uh, completely opposite end of the heart tube, with the folding of the heart tube, they came close. But you still can appreciate a space in between them. Look at this space in between, guys. The one which I'm highlighting here. This is called as a sinus. And what sinus is that? That is called as a transverse sinus. This sinus is called as a transverse sinus here. What is an advantage of transverse sinus? Well, this transverse sinus is through. In your, in your first year practical, they even ask you to put a finger behind the ascending iota and pulmonary trunk. And you can see your finger is actually, can be seen appearing from the other side. That means these sinuses are through. You can go through them. And that's why they can be used surgically for the ligation of great vessels in cardiac surgery. 
if you're doing any 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 major cardiac surgery and let's say you have to ligate ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk you can actually pass your ligate ligature from this transfer sinus and you can ligate this ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk using using your ligature going through this transfer sinus so having a surgical importance there similarly there is another sinus present here and that sinus is present in this region look at this the one which is present between the pulmonary veins the one which is present between the pulmonary veins this guys here is an oblique sinus this sinus here is an oblique sinus let me just use a different highlighter that's an oblique sinus if you think about pulmonary veins are going into which chamber pulmonary veins are coming into the left atrium so this oblique sinus is present behind the left atrium now this oblique sinus is surrounded by the the venous tube only there is no contribution of arterial tube that is above this is a venous tube which is like covering this oblique sinus it is open below and it is like closed above so it's not through it's a culdi sac it's a blind sac so what could be the advantage of oblique sinus well may not be the surgical advantage but it is having a natural advantage and that is if you if you can look carefully can you see the impression of the esophagus look at that this here is an impression for esophagus esophagus is present just behind the left atrium of the heart if there is no space behind the left atrium every time the left atrium will expand it will compress the esophagus that means every time the left atrium expand it should be accompanied with a dysphagia doesn't happen why because we have a space behind the left atrium and that is called as oblique sinus so this space here which is present behind the left atrium is called as oblique sinus which is providing an additional space for the left atrium to expand posteriorly without compressing esophagus let's try to draw this diagram in a schematic way but the more or less the same kind of diagram only so we are again drawing this uh, the picture in which the heart has been removed and we are only looking at the pericardium on the posterior wall so guys this once again is the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk and as i said both ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk they are enclosed in the single continuous layer of visceral pericardium which is called as an arterial tube this here represents the arterial tube this is ascending aorta and there is a pulmonary trunk make sure to draw the pulmonary trunk more anteriorly compared to the ascending aorta then coming to the vein venous part we got a superior vena cava we got inferior vena cava and we got these four pulmonary veins entering into the posterior wall of left atrium svc that is ivc i'm just writing p for the pulmonary veins and there we go this here is the visceral pericardium which is forming a venous tube covering all these veins so that here is the venous tube arterial tube venous tube the same kind of picture i'm trying to replicate the one we saw so we got a ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk in one tube and in one one uh, layer of pericardium in visceral pericardium enclosed that is an arterial tube thing and these all are derived from the sinus venosa that is venous end the sinus the transverse sinus so the two sinuses that we appreciate here this here is the transverse sinus and the one which is present here is the oblique sinus that is the transverse sinus so guys in the transverse sinus what is there on the anterior aspect and what is there on the posterior aspect anteriorly and posteriorly well at times this two dimensional diagram can confuse you because in this diagram it looks like superior and inferior but we know that ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk are coming from the front and then going above like this when you put the finger in the transverse sinus it was behind ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk so if i am doing it for myself i'll put the finger behind the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk so anterior relation is the arterial tube 
and the posterior relation is the venous tubule. So this is anterior relation because these vessels will be coming from the front and going like that. And these are all posterior relation here. So transverse sinus anterior relation will be the ascending iota and pulmonary trunk that is a great vessels present in front. And posterior relation is the superior vena cava and pulmonary veins. Superior pulmonary veins I can say. Venous tube, other end. Anterior relation is the arterial tube, posterior relation is the venous tube. And having these ascending iota and pulmonary trunk in front and this transfer sinus being through. So the advantage of transfer sinus is it can be used. As I said, it can be used to ligate, to ligate great vessels in cardiac surgeries. Can be used to ligate the great vessels in cardiac surgeries. So that's about the, the transfer sinus. On the other hand, here we have an oblique sinus. Oblique sinus. Now, first thing guys, oblique sinus is present only within the venous tube and it is a cul de sac. It is a blind sac. So it is a cul de sac. Cul de sac means it is a blind sac. Oblique sinus is present. Where it is present? It is present behind. It is present behind left atrium. It is obviously within the within the venous tube only. You can see it is within the venous tube, but it is behind which chamber? That's an important thing. It is behind the left atrium. And that's why the advantage of the oblique sinus is it provides additional dead space. It gives off this additional dead space. for expansion of left atrium posteriorly expansion of left atrium posteriorly without compressing on esophagus without compressing esophagus esophagus being the posterior relation of left atrium so we need some space behind the left atrium so that when it, it expands it does not cause any comp compression on the esophagus. So it's an additional dead space which is present behind the left atrium which allows it to go backward or expand backward without compressing esophagus. So this is about the, the pericardium and the pericardial sinus. The two sinuses, the transverse sinus which is through a surgical importance, it holds a surgical importance, oblique sinus which is present behind the left atrium and it is having more of a natural advantage of providing the additional space to left atrium. So this is about the pericardium part. In the next, we'll talk about the heart.